Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bible Talk Live. I am Bill Rhodes. I'm Brian Carey. And this is Doug McKinney. Well, guys, we started a discussion last week. We're going to finish this week on peer pressure. Yep. And it's been a, a you know, peer pressure is just far reaching. I, I don't think there's anyone uh, on the face of the planet that's not. Uh, subject to it. I, I, I don't believe. I think we all are. We all it, like to think we're above it, but I think you're right. Yeah. We're, we're not. It, it, it can come from family. It can come from friends. Yep. It can come from people we work with, people we shop with, people we go on vacation with. I mean, it can come uh, from a lot of different places, and it can be uh, bad uh, influence, or it can be good. Uh, we have to determine that. I, I, I tell you, there are times I have advised people that you need to change your friends mm -hmm. <laughs> because they are leading you down a path that simply is not good. Oh, amen, amen. So <clears throat> we're talking about the power of peer pressure, and most of the time when we talk about the power of peer pressure, we think of it from a negative perspective. Yes. Uh, and, and usually that's that's what we're dealing with. We're, we're dealing with the negative influences of those around us. But not only is peer pressure negative, but it's also positive. If yeah. you hang around the right people, that makes a difference as well. Here's the bottom line, Brian. Whether we like it or not, we care what people think. Oh, man, I wish that wasn't true. I, I'd like to argue with you about that one, but that's, that is a, as much as we like to think, and, and I've heard people brag about this. I don't care what anybody else says. I just, you know, I make up my own mind. I say what I want to say. You know, at the end of the day, there are still plenty of people that, that you care about what they think. And you That's want, to, right. you want yeah. them to think the best yeah. of you, even if you never hear the words. Yeah, you listen to folks, you know, they walk around, they're dressing. A, well, I kind of dress for myself here. I don't care why. Yes, you do. You want people to think you're dressing for yourself. That's, you that's know, your that, trick. That, that's, your, that's what your deal is, you know, whatever that is. There is something about what other people think that drives us. And that's not always a bad thing, Bill. No, it, it's really not, Andy. Depends. I mean, last week you mentioned 1 Corinthians uh, 15, do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. Uh, there's a positive side uh, yeah. to that, and that is good company uh, really helps you establish good morals in it your does. life. And and I have watched people over the years, Doug, that have come uh, to be Christians, and and at the early stage of, of life, they, they may have dressed in ways uh, that, that was not becoming a Christian, but we watched them as they watched Christian people. And all of a sudden, things begin to change. They change in the way they dress. They change in the way they look. They change uh, in the t kind of language that they use. They often, very often change uh, in, in the people that they hang out with. And so those things have a very, very positive influence on you. And, I, and we're going to talk about that today. I love the positive side of this. Yeah, I do too. And Brian, we've known for some time, even the secular world we live in realizes the importance of mentorship. And so they, they want to get young folks hooked up with someone who will be a good mentor in their life. Why? Because they see that role model really matters. That's, that's absolutely correct. I think that's a large part of why the church exists at all is for that, that mentorship, for us to, mm -hmm. to find peers that give us positive uh, peer pressure. Because when you think about it, does, does God need his church to come together? Is that something God had? Like, oh, it sure would be nice if a bunch of my people got together and said nice things about me. I'm like, <laughs> no, God. God doesn't need that. That's not right. for him. That's for us. He knew that we needed that. He knew that we needed that mentorship. He knew that we needed to make friends who had similar beliefs and, and that that peer pressure could reinforce our beliefs and help us. And well, this is going to be a shocking kind of a program, I think, for some, because we are actually going to look at uh, a passage of Scripture that talks about the gathering of God's people and really tells us why we are to gather. And that's Hebrews chapter 10. As always, I say this each week, but I am a broken record about it. And that is that I was, uh, Every time you turn on Bible Talk Live, we're going to be talking about the Bible. Yeah. And we're always yeah. trying to get people to turn their hearts and minds back to God's Word. This morning, no exception to the rule. because We don't we, know how to talk about anything else. That's right. This is Bible Talk, for crying out loud. It ought to be about the Bible. And so we're going to, we're going to talk about those things from the Scriptures that matter. Why? Because we believe the right talk is Bible talk. To spend time in the Bible and to talk about the Word of God. Why? Because the Bible holds the answer to life's problems. Uh, it is the written Word which tells us about the living Word 
the Lord Jesus Christ who solves all of our problems. Uh, verse 19 of chapter 10 of Hebrews is where we're going to start. We're going to read verse 19 through verse 25. So if you've got your Bible, break it out. For some of you, you may have to dust it off a little <laughs> bit, blow the dust out of it. Or if you've got your electronic device, as Brian does here, and he's, he's, uh, he's really happy with that electronic device. And Bill has both. He's got an electronic got device, and he's got his paper in front of him as well. Uh, today, I just have my... My Bible sitting in front of me here, but whatever, get into the Word of God. And so we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 25. And Brian, are you prepared to read? Oh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to be reading today from the New Living Translation of Scripture, starting in Hebrews chapter 10 and beginning in verse 19. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. Mm. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works, and let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. All right, let's bounce back through this passage of Scripture a little bit, kind of set the stage for what we're going to talk about. Verse 19 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now, because of this new covenant that he has been talking about, not just the high priest can go into the holy of holies, but all of God's people can go into the very presence of God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He calls it by this new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. God became man, that man being the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, we have now seen God in a way that we would have never seen him prior to this. He was always distant. Now he is drawn near. He's drawn near to us by his flesh. We have seen God through Jesus Christ. And this, this wall, this curtain as he talks about here, that kept us out of the holy of holies has been torn for us. And we are now able to go into the very presence of God Almighty. We draw, he says, let us draw near. Let us draw near. I want to repeat that and repeat that and repeat that. It is open for us so we should draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I actually think that uh, Bill is... is uh, uh, Speaking of our baptism, uh, I, I think that that is what he's talking about in that passage of Scripture when he talks about having our bodies washed. Yeah, I think so too. I, I mean, he's going back to the Old Testament labor, and, and they washed themselves before they went into the presence of God, and they washed themselves every time they went to the presence of God on, on the Day of Atonement. And uh, I think it was the precursor to modern-day baptism. I think there was a similarity yeah, there is. Uh, between the two. The high priest did that. Yeah, the high priest did that. And, and, and today, Peter, uh, you know, we talked about Peter a lot last yes, week. We did. But he's the one who declares that we are the that we are the priest of God today. We are the priest. And so, yeah, I, I think it, it's talking about that washing that we do uh, in baptism where we are buried into death, raised to a new life mm. uh, as, we, uh, as we come to Christ. And so he says here that uh, uh, our hearts have been sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies have been washed pure with water. So why is he saying all of that? He's saying all of that so that we would have a confidence to enter into the presence of God so that we realize that Jesus, because of his blood, because of what's taken place, we can go into the very throne room of God. So let us hold fast our confession of hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. 
And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Brian, you alluded to this a, a little bit earlier, and that is all of a sudden now we're seeing church in a little different light. We're, we're seeing the gathering of God's people maybe uh, it, with, with a little different purpose. You know, I've heard statements like this, and they, and they sound so noble. They sound so, so uh, pious and, and right. Uh, you know, when we gather together, we gather for the audience of one. You know, like we're coming here to, to worship God and give yeah. God all that he deserves. The problem with that is that it, it, it isn't biblical. It isn't what we see from a scriptural no, standpoint. No. From a scriptural standpoint, Brian, what we see is that God created the gathering of his people not because he needed it, but because we needed it. Oh, I think that is absolutely true. I wish I wish more people understood that simple truth. Uh, I see you see too much. So to if you let me uh, digress just a little bit, you see way too many people think. Well, I I probably should you know uh, yeah I want to get right with my maker. I need to do better. But you know my life is such a mess. Maybe after I do this right. Once, once I get my, you know, language cleaned up, once I get a better job, once I get my, you know, my marriage figured out and I quit smoking and I do, and they've got this laundry list of things that they think they got to do before they can ever go to church. And that's, that's not the point. You don't get cleaned up to go to church. Church is, is where you can come in and experience some, some positive effects from other people who've been through what you've been through. The Lord is the one who's going to change your life anyways. It was never up to you to fix it in the first place. Yeah, and, and in truth, in, in some ways, now this is not to say, and I may be opening up a can of worms here with this, but this is not to say that it's not for the unbeliever. Because we see in 1 Corinthians that the unbeliever was coming in. That they were there and that they would fall on their face and confess that God is among you. But Bill, it really, the design, the Lord's Supper, all of what we're doing is really for the believer. It is for the believer. And, and, and you're right, there are unbelievers who, who get something out of it. I mean, you and I over the years have watched people <clears throat> come into assembly. We, we've seen people stay. We've seen people come forward, baptized into Christ right. because they're sitting and listening and learning. Uh, and, and, and we applaud all of that. But you're yes. absolutely right <clears throat> that the design of this whole thing is really for God's people, for the believer. We need it more than anything else. I love his illustration here because he starts out talking about the temple. And, and, and he does that throughout uh, the book, by the way. And, uh, and he talks about the Old Testament idea of only the high priest uh, entering into the most holy place. And, and everybody else was left out. God was, God was there. And, and what it was designed to show them was that there was a separation between them and God. He wanted them to see that separation. He wanted them to know that, that they could not come into his presence. And so when Peter begins to talk about us being a royal priesthood, mm. uh, that we have this special access to God, and, and Hebrews 4 says exactly what you were talking about, uh, Doug. He says, so, that, so since then, we have a great high priest who has entered heaven. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings mm. we do, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of our gracious God. I just love that line. It gives us now access to God that they always knew they did didn't have. There was always a separation. But when he, uh, at the resurrection, tore that uh, uh, curtain, and, and this was a huge, thick curtain yeah. uh, that, that separated the holy place from the most holy place, when he tore that in two uh, from top to bottom, it changed everything for us. All of a sudden, we can have, through Jesus Christ, this direct access to the Father. And I'm telling you, what a difference that makes in the life of a believer. Yeah, and think about this for a moment, Brian, that my, my objective now when I gather together with God's people is to consider them, to consider one another. So uh, I'm coming to church and it's Sunday morning and we invite you to come to Christ Church this morning, 10 a.m. We'd love to have you meet with us, 14455 Campbell Hill Road. But what we don't want you to do is come in and say, what am I going to get out of this? Mm. <laughs> right? I hope, yeah. they, I hope they play the music, Brian, that I like. Right? I, I hope the preacher's not too long-winded. 
I, I hope he I hope he preaches about a, a, a topic or a text that I need to hear. Yeah. I mean, all of these kind of things are very selfish. When we gather together as God's people, we're first to consider one another. We're to look around and actually have to think about the needs of the body of Christ. When we go into our next life, the thing we get to take with us is our relationships. Mm -hmm. Our relationship with our Lord and our relationship with, with each other. If we put no time into ever reaching out to any other fellow Christians, we have no relationships to take with us. We have no nothing to strengthen us. We we have nothing to lean on when we when we need it. We don't have any any good counsel. Anybody can I, I mean I mean you, you guys I know you're gonna have a hard time believing this, but I don't know all the stuff. <laughs> and sometimes Sometimes I need to go ask people, hey, what do you think about this? And sometimes I know the answer and it's just me, but I'm there and I'm yeah. too involved. And I need a neutral person that I trust that has God's Holy Spirit that I can go, you know what, Bill? You know what, Doug? I've known you guys for all these years. I trust you guys. I'm in this situation. I'm not sure what do I, what do, I do. Yeah. I have a relationship now that I can do that and I can get that positive peer pressure. I can get that positive feedback. I can get some righteous counsel. What am I going to do if I'm if I'm just all off by my onesie keeping church, just me and my wife in my garage because uh, I, I just can't bring myself to come to church for whatever reason? Yeah, so consider this now and, and I'll slide this over to, to Bill to think about it. We are to think about, we are to consider those who come and gather. And we're to consider them, Bill, for this reason, to stir up love and good works. So what I'm, what I'm contemplating, what I'm thinking about, is how can I help you be a better child of God? How can I help you be more like Christ? How can I spur you on to love and good works? Yeah, I tell you what, there's never been an assembly, and I've been to thousands of them over the years. I, I mean, just... Uh, there's never been an assembly I didn't get something out of, or hear something I needed to hear, whatever, I, whatever it was. It was a topic that, that I, I thought didn't affect me. I still heard things I needed to hear yeah. uh, in that. It may have affected someone next to me more than that. Uh, but the reality is we do that. We do an invitation for that very reason. We want people to feel free uh, to come to the front and say they need prayers. You can tell us what it is, not tell us what it is. We don't care. God knows. Uh, but we do that for a reason. We have we have a prayer time in the back of the auditorium where you can go back and someone will pray with you. And we do that. That's right. <clears throat> by design for a reason. So I'm just telling you, and and, I, and I'm not putting down people who are doing this, but the reality is what you see on what what you need to get out of all of this, you can't get watching TV like that. You might hear the words, yeah. uh, but you don't get the atmosphere. You don't get the time. You don't. You, you, you don't get the emotions that yeah. come with, uh, with all of it. And, and besides that, I'm just going to put it out plainly. This is not a suggestion. This is a, a command from God. It is. Not forsaking. And, and forsaking, what he, what he really means is that we are intentionally leaving it alone. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. And so yeah. some were doing it then. I don't know what they were doing. They weren't watching it on TV. Uh, but, but, but they were forsaking the assembly. And, and God is making it clear that he wants us to be part of that assembly. Uh, I'm just telling you, you can't replace it with anything else. The question is, uh, how do you spur one another on yes. love and good works without it? Without being with them? Yes. You know, so it, it's it, impossible. It, yeah. How, how do I consider you yeah. if I don't know who you are? Yeah. And, or and you, if you're here yes. or, or any of that, how do I, and all of these things that he talks about here, how do I stir you up to love and good works? How do I encourage you and exhort you so much the more as you see the day approach? Yeah. How, do, how do I do that? If I'm not with you, no, that's exactly right. You can't do it if you're not if if you're not here. And and, and we've come to believe. I mean, we are in a a, a society that has become to be more uh, consumer. It's really a consumeristic society. They're consuming, and, and everything they look at. The question is always, how does this benefit me? Do I need this? Yeah. You know, how am I going to use this? How is it going to be uh, make my life better? And and people are approaching church. Uh, in exactly that way, instead of approaching church in a way that says, how can I make someone else's life better? How, how might I say, listen, I've come into the assembly of God's people. I have seen people that I know something was wrong in their life. I've seen it. 
and you can tell when somebody is struggling with something. What if you were there at that time and you said something to them that mattered, uh, that, that really built them up, that made them feel better? Even if you just said to them, you know what, I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to pray for you because I really believe something is wrong. And I'm telling you, God opens those doors. He opens the door to allow us to really affect the lives of other people if we will accept that and, and get off of this kick that is all about me. Yeah, uh, I'm amazed, Brian, uh, <clears throat> by how many people do not think about that. Oh, they think don't think about the reality that if I don't show up today, that affects people. It's discouraging. Ima imagine if everybody chose the route you chose. Wow. That's a great point. I, I mean, think about that for a moment. If, if everybody gave as you gave, if, every, if everybody did as you did, if everybody lived as you lived, what would the world look like? What, what would it be like? Uh, and that's an important question, especially when we're talking about positive peer pressure. Yes. This positive peer pressure happens when we gather together with each other. And guess who's with us? God is with us. Christ's Spirit is with us, living within us. And He has gifted us, Brian, for this very reason. So that we can use those spiritual gifts that He's given us to build and to edify the body of Christ. I think, uh, Doug, I think it's real easy for people to just sit home and go, well, you know, even if they do have this, I think that most people don't have that idea in mind that you just talked about where, where I'm going to go to church and I'm going to go help people. But those few people that that does occur to them, even that person is going to go, well, what can I possibly contribute? You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm nobody. I'm not special. I don't even know most of these people. What am I, I'm going to go there and do what? Yeah. You know, they, they're, they're going to have all the self-doubt and negativity and, and just the opposite is what they need. They're going to go and just being there helps people. If you just smile and shake somebody's hand, that that is all the skill that you need to go help somebody have a little bit better day. Uh, I'm going to tell you, their presence matters. And yes. think about this for a moment, Bill. Think in your family if you had a birthday party for one of your kids and nobody <laughs> came. Yeah. I mean, what, what, would that, what would that feel like to them? Yeah. How, how would that impact them? How, what would that say to them? The same thing, when we gather together as God's people and people willingly choose not to be here or choose something else apart from that, how does it make the other people feel? I mean, that's the that's the part that they don't doesn't seem to resonate. With. No, and 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 you're absolutely right. I mean, if I had a party for one of my kids and nobody showed up, it, it'd be devastating for my for my child. It'd be devastating for me. I'd, I'd be thinking, what disrespect? Yeah. These people don't have any care about me. And, and that's why I love when 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 the Hebrew writer starts this. He says this, which I think is really important. Uh, in verse 23, he says, "Let us hold tightly, without wavering, to the hope we affirm." That's right. I mean, we are coming together. One of the things that we're doing is that we are affirming what God has given us. Man, I am here affirming to everyone that this God that I serve, then he goes on to say this, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Oh, yes. Yeah. He can be trusted. So when I show up here, man, I'm telling you what, First of all, God's invited me. I mean, that's yeah. a good analogy. Yeah, that's right. God has invited me. And if I don't show up, what kind of disrespect am I showing to God? And I'm telling everyone that, uh, you know, this hope we're talking about, I really don't care that much about it. And Brian, he calls it here in verse 25, forsaking those who have assembled. Oh, that's uh, putting I, it about as a negative spin on that as he can, I would I, think. I, well, and you know, how many people think of it that way when they just choose, for whatever reason, not to come to church that morning? And I'm not talking about somebody who's sick. I'm not talking about somebody who has to work and has no choice in it. I'm, I'm talking about those who willingly choose not to come and assemble themselves together, they're forsaking the assembly. That, that means to, to leave them in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a situation where uh, you're not giving them what you're supposed to be giving. You're forsaking yeah. them. Yeah, it's a bold determination to do exactly that. Yeah, I'm not going to go. 
I'm just not going to go. I, I I can watch it on TV. I don't care. I'm just not going to go. You know, I think that it can go e- a, a different way than that. I think that that happens absolutely, but there's also people that, that it just kind of happens to them. They were a Christian. They they got baptized. They're on fire. And the next thing you know, that not so much anymore. And uh, like, well, I've, I've heard about Jesus. What else are you going to tell me about him that I don't? You know, I've heard the stories. I've read the New Testament. There's a really good football game on. I really don't want to miss this. It's football season. I'm I'm going to watch the game. It's okay to miss one. It's not a big deal. And the next week, well, you know what the news is on, and this is kind of a big news story. I'm gonna I'm gonna catch up on this before you realize that six months have gone by and you haven't been to church. I'm uh, I'm gonna tell you something, Brian. The devil does his best to keep people away from us. Uh, I, I'm not kidding when I say that. And here's why. Because he knows when they get under the preaching and teaching of God's Word, when they get under the conviction of those Christians that are around them, when they get fed the food they need to have a healthy spiritual life, all of a sudden they start, Bill, living differently. Oh, that's That's exactly right. right. And and, and that's what's important about what we're we're talking about here. I I tell you what, I need the positive peer pressure that I see here. I, I need to see other people who are living out their faith. I need to see other people who are teaching and preaching and, and, love and Jesus. love Jesus, man. They're here for no other reason than they are absolutely, undeniably dedicated to Him. I'm going to tell you, throughout our lives, we raised three kids, and now there's eight grandkids, but we've raised three kids, and they will tell you today that there was never a time that they ever said to us, let's don't go to church today, because they already <laughs> knew the answer. It was a, it was a foregone <laughs> conclusion. We were going no matter what. It didn't make any difference to us what they had going on, what was happening. We were going to work that around church because we're going to church. And it is powerful when a when a family really determines to come and be a part of things. That really binds a family together, Doug. It, it does. Yeah, it does. I mean, people will say, well, we need to do something with our family. You know, we've got to do... <laughs> you think? You, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yes. yeah, do something with your family. Come to church with them, you know. be <laughs> Make it a family day. Come to church, eat together, spend time together, do all of that. Uh, why? Because there is there is power in this peer pressure. And, and when you when you come in and you feel it and you've got others around you, one of the things that was always so encouraging to us when, especially coming from smaller congregations, is when you would go to something, you, you know, you talked about Tulsa, when you go to the yeah. Christian convention, when you go to things like that and all of a sudden now you're seeing thousands of people who love Jesus and you realize, Bill, you're not alone. You're not God, alone. That's exactly right. And, and many of God's people over the years needed to realize that too. They needed to realize they, they weren't the only ones. And I, I tell you, Doug, I, I've had people ask me over the years, how do you raise faithful kids? We raised three faithful kids. How do you do that? And, and I'm going to tell you, we took them to everything we could take them to. We, we wanted them involved in every youth program. I have seen people punish their kids by not letting them go to, to uh, youth events. And I'm Ouch. like, what are you doing? Well, h- how in the world can you possibly think like this? Yeah. I've also had people come to me and, and uh, they're kids are in their teens. Now their kids don't want to go anymore. These are some of the same families. Not always. I'm not always blaming families here, but often they are some of the same families that uh, that when their kids didn't want to go, they didn't go. When they had something else going on, they went something else. And now they don't have any dedication to it whatsoever. I I think you're right. I think the devil really wants you to think you're alone. You're the last guy who thinks like that. Like, What kind of old fossil (laughs) are you? Nobody thinks like that anymore. We have this new peer pressure in America. We're going to we're going to believe these different yeah. morals now. We're going to do things different. We're yeah. going to say this is okay and that's not yeah. anymore. We're going to flip everything up. And you don't think this way? You're the last one. You're yeah. all alone. Nobody yeah. thinks like that. And no. when you come to church, you realize when you're in the middle of those thousands of other people, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not alone at all. I Everybody say, thinks I don't like ca- I don't care who you are. It's hard to hold on like that. Yes. Man. It is hard to hang in there like that. It's, I've often used the illustration. It's like taking, uh, you know, if you have a real fire, not fake things, mm-hmm. you have a real fire and you take a hot amber with something and you take it out and you lay it on a cold hearth and just lay it there. Once you take it out of that hot fire, that thing is dying yeah. and it's going to be dead before long. Put it back in. And, and, and so for me, the church assembly and the church gatherings, that's the fire. 
Yeah, and boy, do we need that fire. This morning, you are listening to Bible Talk Live, whether you're watching us on YouTube and Facebook or whether you're listening on our flagship station, 1430 AM WFOB. We are very glad you're with us. We are talking about the power of peer pressure. Last week, we talked about the power of negative peer pressure, how it will destroy folks. And we are talking this week about how positive peer pressure really makes a difference. And Brian, one of the, the best places we can find positive peer pressure is in the Lord's church. Absolutely. I, and it, one of the things that I absolutely love about church is we have this thing called the Bible. And I know it's weird, like, you're gonna, you're in church, what are you doing reading the Bible? Yeah, but, but, <laughs> but it's a thing. And you have, you have some consistency in your life. I know why I believe what I believe. Yeah. I, yeah. I have something I can lean on that it's the same every single week. I don't have yeah. to worry about, like, this. Uh, in America, we have, like, this revolving door morality right now. Like what was, I can't use these words anymore. Or those have been demonized and now I have to believe that, you know, everybody wants me to believe this other changing uh, moral value. I, I don't like that. I don't understand that. I can't build logic and purpose on a shifting foundation. That's this shifting sand that we have now. But I come yeah. to church and, and we read the passages from the Bible and it just rings true. I know why I believe what I believe. My, my belief system is based on the word that I find in the Bible, and it gives me strength, and I love that. Uh, amen. There's, yeah. there's no doubt about yeah. it. And when we read through this passage of Scripture here, Billy says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, there's a couple thoughts with regard to the day approaching. Well, one of the thoughts of seeing the day approaching is the fact that the second coming of Christ is coming. And, and I don't have any problem with that most of the time. Uh, when you'll see like the New Living Translation, go, it, it will go ahead and, and interpret it that way. Even though that's not what's literally being said. It's, it's just telling us that this day is approaching. My particular translation, the New King James, capitalizes day. But I heard a brother say this once, Bill, and I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit about it. But I heard him say that you need to remember that the Christians, when they met, they met on the first day of the week. The first day of the week was the first day of their work week. It wasn't like we look at it today as Sunday. Yeah, yeah. The Saturday yeah, was... Yeah, they was, often met very early because of that. Yeah, that's absolutely and, and, right. And he said it is possible, not saying that it isn't talking about you know, the second coming of Christ, the day of the Lord approaching. But he said it's possible that they, when they looked at this, he said, as you see the day approaching, as the sun is coming up, as you're getting ready to go out into the world, as you're going to be affected by this, we're going to encourage you all the more. Because when do you need it? You, you need it because you're headed out into a, a, a society that is anti-God, that is pagan. Yeah. And, and that's why we gather together. We gather together to spur each other on to love and good works because you're going to go out and they're going to beat you up when you get out there. And I thought that was a, a pretty interesting Yeah, I, uh, listen, I like that. I don't mind it at all. I, I, I think it's one of two things. I, I don't believe it's the second coming because as you see the day approaching, there were no signs of the second coming. In fact, Peter says it's going to be like a thief in the night. And so you're not going to see that approaching. And so I, I, I just kind of discount that, even though the NLT translators seem to lean that yeah, way. I, do. Uh, I either think it's the first day of the week, and I really like that explanation. I think it's very, very good. Some believe that it's uh, AD 70, destruction of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. there, there were signs for that that yep. he gave and, and, and told them what to watch out with regard to time. I and think he hints to things. that earlier. Yeah, he does. He does hint at that earlier. You would expect him to in, in, in a book like Hebrews. Right. Uh, but I, I think it's one of those two. I, I don't know that we'll ever know for sure. Yeah. Uh, but the reality is, whatever day that is, man, as we see it approaching, yeah. if it's the first day of the week uh, for us, uh, we need to do exactly that. I'm telling you, the first day of the week is monumental and important, and we need to make it important in our lives. And that's that's the bottom line for all of us. So we are about done, yeah. and I want to I want to uh, close with one passage. I'll I'll leave with you. First Peter four four says. 
uh, this. This is Peter talking after we talked about him so much last week. He said, of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do, so they slander you. I want you to know that he's talking about a time when you have changed your life, and that's when you come to Christ. Thanks for joining us. Be with us next week on Bible Talk Live.